You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I started playing for Liverpool schoolboys then. Playing against like Salford, uh, Manchester schoolboys. I had a great nemesis called the nemesis, Ryan Giggs. Ryan Giggs played for uh, Salford. At the time, I was a right midfielder, so he was a left midfielder, so me and him are glad. I played against Liverpool loads of times, B team, A team, U team, reserves. I'd never been beat off them. I hated them, you know what I mean? It was like, it was more than a footy game. It was more, it was always more than a football game. My life changed after that derby to like superstars. I was fucking like one of the Beatles in the end, you know what I mean? Walking around the city and everyone wanted to bit of me and, and I loved it James I, I loved everything about being a, a professional footballer and then uh, I lo absolutely loved it mate I loved the fame I loved everything about it most, of, most importantly I was playing for Everton I was playing for Everton's first team it was, me, it was my wildest dream come through so you can imagine I can remember I tried it and I woke up the next day feeling fucking rough as fuck I thought never again with that, it just wasn't me, you know what I mean? I was just into fitness. I remember waking up rough as fuck and then I'd have to go into Belfield to get treatment because of my injuries and... And then it just snowballed from there, James. That was only about six, seven months after that derby game, all this was happening. That's how quick I lost the plot. That's how quick I went from hero to zero with the drinking and the depression and the drugs and that. Because I'd just come out of the rehab and he would tell me all about this. One's too many, a thousand's never enough. But you thought, I thought, I'll be all right, it's a couple of fucking bevies, you know what I mean? There you go. I had, it, I had, that, I had that one drink. And i tell you what, mate, a thousand wasn't enough. Because from there, I just went down the same slope before it goes any further, I'm retiring. How about that? To myself. I thought, you fucked it again. You're doing everyone's head in around you. Me, me family, everyone who cares about me. So do you know what, lad? I'm retiring. And I did. I retired. I was 21. Ben Moran. Yes, Jimmy. Yes, Billy Let's boy. Do it, lads. Yes, and today's guest, yes. we've got Billy Kenny. How are you, Bill? Thanks, mate. I'm sound, James. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. I know you're very well known down this neck of was Liverpool. Everton superstar came through the ranks, 19, man of the match against Liverpool, running a mock in the Premier League. And um, over the last 30 years, you've kind of went missing. You Absolutely say, missing. Up around the bend. Um, yeah, playing for Everton, living in the city. It's a great experience, James, to be honest, when I first started. Um, it's all I dreamt about, was playing for Everton as it, um, all the way growing up in, uh, in Burlington Street, off Scotland Road there. So it was, a, it was mad growing up in Liverpool. It was either Liverpool or Everton, you know what I mean? Everyone supports us. Most of them are Liverpool supporters, to be honest, but... It was a great time, me playing with me mates, uh, dreaming, I just all go to bed and dream about the same dream. Every single night was to beat Liverpool in the Merseyside derby. I couldn't dream of nothing else. Every time I closed my eyes, same dream. Same dream, open up one day, I'd, I'd run out there, I'd go to and, and face Liverpool. Because at the time, um, growing up in the 80s, and that, I mean, Liverpool were brilliant, you know what I mean? They were winning everything and... Oh, it used to kill me, man. I used to think to myself, maybe one day I'll be able to um, sort it out, you know what I mean? Do something, help Everton, help the fans beat this Liverpool. And um, my dream come true. My dream come true, James. Uh, the highlight of my life playing again the Merseyside derby. I played in two Merseyside derbies, but the one we get, I get noticed for was the one that we won. 2-1. We won 2-1. We won two -one. Um, great night. I watched the game. I watched the game the other night myself, first time in twenty years. It was a great game, mate. Mm -hmm. It was a really great game. So yeah, um, that was it. That was my dream. Your dreams come true, my like my dreams come true. Um, I work so hard, James. Um, I have to sacrifice a lot 
to like to make it to play for Everton in the first team. A lot of hard work went into it. Um, all my life trained really hard. I was training with all the boxers around the city, getting myself in tip top shape and that. And um, it happened for me. It, um, it was it was a great time yeah. in my life. At your start of your career, everybody was talking about you as the next young prospect to then not just take Ever Everton but England. Like you were potentially becoming the next big superstar. Then you had an injury. You went through your addiction problems, and over the last thirty years, you've kind of battled with addiction, which we'll touch on. You retired kind of at twenty one, but before we get into all that, let's go right back to the start, Bill. Right, just go through your life, where you grew up, and how it all began. Well, I grew up in a um, little shoplifting village. In in the middle of Scotland Road and and the uh, Vauxhall Road called Burlington Street, I mean, if you wasn't watching football or playing football, you're more than likely shoplifting. You know what I mean? Because we were like right next to the city centre and like, I mean, great people from that area. They wouldn't like rob off anyone out your houses or not like that. Not on them sort of robbers. They just go to town and like. Because in the 80s as well, everyone was skint. It was You had to fucking feed yourself or you wanted to take your, your girl out the pitches or something. There was nothing else to do. You'd either play footy or went and shoplift, you know. So, um, yeah, I used to run around. Um, as far back as I can remember, I must have been about seven, James, um, keeping the ball up. And now I'm barely... And my dad, my dad played for Everton. My dad was a great player. Uh, my dad, he played for Everton in the 70s. With Kendall and Harvey and all my, my you know, the managers who I was going to play under. But my dad plays in the in 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 that team, and um, so we used to like give me like all little tezzers, go and keep ten up, go and keep the ball up for ten, and I'd be there all day keeping the ball up, and I and give us a shout when you've done that, you know what I mean? So I'd do ten all day, about fucking seven I was. Go in, dad, I've done ten. Good lad, go and do twenty. I think he used to just do that, you know, to keep me out of trouble, yeah. you know what I mean? So we have done that, and um, I can remember getting all my little mates together out the streets. See, see, see in Burlington Street, it was like, um, well, I watched all the old stuff about Glasgow. It was like the Gorbals, Burlington Street, you no, know, just big tenements, yeah. hundreds of them, all families everywhere, big round block it was. And I thought to myself, I wonder whether I could keep the ball up. I'm bar nine, eight, nine, all the way round. I remember the summer holidays, um, I, I started to talk to myself, said to me little mate, little Leah, said, come with us, lads, I, I want to see if I can keep the ball up right the way around Bailey, you know, he said, oh, you're fucking messing around here, it was a big, massive Bailey, it was like the size of Wembley, you know what I mean, going to the outside. So I did, I started um, keeping the ball up, up and down, and I'd get halfway around, I'd drop it, I'd have to run all the way back up, and I wouldn't stop until I'd done it, you know what I mean? It took me all summer holidays, and I remember doing it, mate. All, all, all my mates, all shouting, all egging me on, trying to put me off. All this, that, and the other. I'm on the home state now, going up barely. Oh, the ball, keeping the ball up, I've been all over the roads hundred times, dropping it, going back, and I eventually done it, mate. And I got to the top, volleyed the ball into the air. I thought it was like Billy boy, you've done it. You know what I mean? I was buzzing. I ran all the way back to Raz with all my mates, because I knew my dad wouldn't believe me, you know what I mean? And uh, I said, I've done it. And all he'd ever say to me, my dad was, uh, well done. And he'd give me something else to do then, you know what I mean? He'd say, what about your left foot? I haven't seen you using your left foot. Then he'd have me, like, hitting the ball against the wall, controlling with my left foot, giving me all stuff like that. And then, as I got to there, uh, my, dad, my dad was playing for a local team then called uh, the Barretts, the Barretts FC. My uncle Joe Bo, he was the manager. My dad played um, players like Ronnie Morgan, um, um, Bobby Boardman, this little Bobby Boardman, this little um, little stocky fella in the middle for me. My dad used to watch him. He used to go in for tackles. He was like, he was nasty on the pitch. I thought that's what I want to play like, you know what I mean? I want to be like him, I want to get stuck in. He was shouting, he was arguing, he was fighting for the ball, he was doing everything. And I was looking at my dad, and my dad was very clever on the ball and and stuff like that. So I would always be watching them. And um, as I got to about 10, 11, I started going to the um, the five side, and my dad's team, James, and my dad's team, he used to have uh, training on a Tuesday in one of the local schools in St. Bridget's School by ours, by Scotland Road there, 
on a Tuesday night with his team. And it's always like, here's a game, you know what I mean? You're too young, get up there on the wall bars, on the wall bars in the gym. I'd have to sit up there and he just used to say, just watch, just watch and, and learn and look how we like keep the ball. And it's not all about scoring, Bill. You've got and you've got to go back with your runners anyway. I was watching for ages, couldn't get a game with them. And I can always remember my Uncle Jobo twisted his ankle in the gym. There was no one else to go on. So my dad shouted me on, yeah, you're on there. So then I'd be like thinking I could do what I was doing with me, with, with my own age in the school, fucking taking everyone on. Well, it wasn't like that playing with my dad and that. He just shepherd you in the corner, take the ball off you. And my dad would always shout at me, fucking do it easy, play it easy. You're trying to dribble this, that, and the other. I'd be welling up, mate. I'd be fucking crying, fuming, thinking, fucking talking to. You're making a cunt to me, I was only a kid. So I'd get home and I'd tell me, man, he's been fucking shouting at me in the gym. She'd be on him. They'd be a little bit of a fucking murder in the <laughs> yeah. house, you know what I mean, over me. But this thing he owned, I'm not, I'd say to my dad, I'm not going no more. Go and let someone else to go. And the next time someone goes off, go and find someone else, all that. And then he'd talk to me. Then he'd go, lads, I'm not getting on your back. I just, you know, you need to look, you need to play the game properly. Because if you want to be a footy player, you know, and uh, so then, I kept going and that with my dad, kept getting more time. And then in the end, I was sort of a, reg a regular in the five sides on the Tuesday. It was only 11. My dad, all the ex-pros playing with my dad, it was a good standard and a different game, a, a different game of football. It was hard. It was a proper way out of playing. It wasn't like playing in the street with my mates. It was another level. It was it was a big level, like uh, in terms of keeping the ball. Don't, he'd say, keep the ball, do it easy, go with your runners. I can remember it being really hard work for me, you know what I mean? Like chasing runners. It wasn't the football I'd been used to. I just didn't know whether I liked this hard work. I didn't even know football was that hard. It wasn't enjoyable again. It was proper hard work, you know what I mean? But I, I, I kept at it, James. And uh, I was playing for the local fucking, the local U club at the time, Sitfield Street, my Uncle Tuby. Used to drag us like and our little Johnny and, and my cousin Tony. There was only a few Evertonians. We used to have a little Everton team. And he'd bring us to all the other youth clubs on our Merseyside, Liverpool, and you know, we'd get the final, we'd win the odd cup and all that. We were only a small team and that and the Merseyside police five sides up on uh, Madder Avenue as well. We went up there, we won that. And then uh, when I was about twelve we were moving from Scotland Road. So we were moving up to by Anfield, right by Liverpool's grounds on May Lane there. And uh, City had folded. It was getting knocked down. Bailey, Bailey's and Street and the U Club. It was all getting demolished at the time. So we moved away. And then uh, Tuby brought me, said, uh, there's a, a good team there. They were training called the Four Swallows. Why don't you go along? And... Uh, and uh, join in with them, they're a good team and that, uh, this, that and the other, they've been going for years, they've won a couple of uh, cups, so I went, I went along to the, the training and uh, I started training with them, I was always a bit chubby, mate. you know, as a kid and that, chubby and like, I found it, um, found it a bit hard, you because know, like, with my fitness and that, because I was carrying a bit of weight, this, that and the other and uh, I signed for the Four Swallows and met me mate Tobo and they're all great players. Great manager, John Bly. Uh, it, was a, it was a proper football and set up and that, and we were dead successful. We won, uh, I think we won 15 trophies once in one year and that. And then from on there, on, from there I joined, uh, I ended up going to the Campion, Campion High School, but I didn't want to go to Campion. Why? It was an all boys school mm -hmm. and there was room. There's no one in the 80s, oh, it's full of faggots in there and gay people. It's not like, no, the way like it was in the 80s. It's not, obviously, it's not along with any gay people. It, they're just normal people, aren't they? But in the 80s, it was a big thing. And then, like, all my mates from my junior school were going to St. Bridget's, the local school. So I said to my dad, I said, Look, I'm uh, made up, we're all going there. He said, You're not going to St. Bridget's. I said, What do you mean? He said, no, he said, that's a mixed school. He said, you're joking, aren't you? And he said, you won't, be, you won't, you won't get picked for any Liverpool schoolboys. My dad played for Liverpool schoolboys as well. He said, they won't pick you. He said, uh, or, or everyone fucks about in the mixed schools, Bill. They don't, even, they don't even have good like PE lessons or good footy school teams. or It's, it's shy for, for, for sports, lads, and all that. 
But I wanted to go, you know what I mean? I just saw my mates were going there. And uh, so for the first week, I sacked the sack school for my first week. Didn't go in. Camping, I was just walking around town. Robbing the alpaca, the other the sayers and that, you know what I mean? Just meeting downtown. <laughs> just didn't want to go into this camping school, right? Because of what I did and all the rumours and all my mates were going to the other school. Where everyone else in Burlington Street went to this school. My sisters went. My cousins, Adam, went. Everyone went to this school. But I couldn't go. My dad wouldn't let me. So after a week of sagging and that, I've gone home one day. My dad says, doesn't your new school give you any uh, homework? You know what I mean? I said, oh, no, I've only been in there a week. He said, you're lying, can't you? You, know, you haven't even been in and that. So that was it. It was on top. He said, I've got to bring you to camping on Monday, you little thing. Get up in your room and all that. So Monday coming and he brought me down to camping. I met the headmaster. And the headmaster's like, saying to me, like, you know, you'll enjoy it, and it's great for sports. He says, I've, I've heard you there, you're good at football and that, and you want to play football and that. He said, well, you're in the right place. He said, listen to your dad and stuff like that. And then after the, he walked me over to me, uh, me, 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 me form class then, my new form class, and because of being off for the first week, yeah, yeah, Everyone was like, oh, matey, there was little firms of lads here, all in, all knew each other, and I felt, I, I hadn't been in, I didn't know anyone. And I was the only one from Burlington Street going to this camping school. They all went to St. Bridges, where I wanted to go, but... So I'm in there anyway, and, that, and I, I've gone in the form class, and then I met um, all my new mates then, um, Joe Bargo, um, great lads from uh, Stanley Rose, all his firm kids there. Uh, Passed away now, kids. He's Joe's, uh, the, the best mates, these lads. Uh, passed away, kids, a couple of years ago. God, God bless them. And um, I met all them and then, uh, you know, started cracking on. Didn't feel ashamed anymore. I thought, you know, wow, it's everyone been going on about the great school. I, I just settled in there quick. My new mates were there. It wasn't long. I was doing all, I was doing great at the end. The new Sunday League team, the Four Swallows, who we were winning all kinds. And then the school team come about. And they were right again. It was a great setup. It was great for sports and camping school. My dad was right again. Got to the, gets in the school team. We had some great players in there. They all went to clubs, professional clubs. John Dool and a great mate of mine. And uh, and, and Duke Hazal, fella, he, he helped me a lot. He used to bring me and my dad to all the Liverpool school boys games. He used to pick us up every week. And um, I started playing for Liverpool school boys then. Playing against like Salford's, uh, Manchester School Boys. I had a great a nemesis called the Nemesis, Ryan Giggs. Ryan Giggs played for uh, Salford. At the time, I was a right midfielder, so he was a left midfielder, so me and him a clash. And it's always be Salford Boys, Liverpool Boys in the finals, semi finals, so me and him a clash. And if you were to ask him today and say, Who's the toughest player you probably played against? He'd probably say me, because I was not being funny. I used to kick him. Like, like, like nobody's business, you know. And he's the most decorated player in English football, and I know why. You know what I'm saying? He, he Ryan Giggs for me, he was just unbelievable. But, but he brought the best out of me as well. You know what I mean? I'd always have a boss game. He'd have it's weird. He'd have a boss game for them, and I'd have a boss game for me. But yet we were marking each other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just I've never like come up against a player like him since in all the games, even for Evans' first team. So Liverpool boys, same thing. We were going on taking me away to the islands and stuff. My first time I go away as as a as a, um, as a footballer. We go to the islands. We went to France. I got played the tournaments in France with Liverpool school boys. And there was some boss French teams there as well. You know, I, I got played the tournament. Lovely big trophy I got from there. Um, and while you're out playing for Liverpool school boys, that's when you get noticed. I wasn't taking myself serious. I was just having these dreams. They were wild dreams, James, for me to play. Wildest dreams ever playing for Evan. That was, uh, every time I shut my eyes, it's the same dream, same dream. But at the time, being 14, you still only know it's a dream. It's a million miles away for you. I didn't think I'd actually do it because I'm one for me weight. I'll tell you how I lost the weight in a minute, but... It was just a big crazy team, but from playing for Liverpool school boys, I had all the scouts coming in and I was doing well. 
And as I said to you earlier before, I always thought coming off the pitch, I could always do better than everyone. Oh, you're brilliant, Billy. I was in the, the local papers, Billy. Can't, I'd always score a couple, set a couple up. It was great. And then all, all, all the... Um, all the scouts from all the different clubs were coming in for me then. Uh, it was getting a bit serious then. Like, Man United were in there, Liverpool, Everton. They were all there, uh, old and scouts. Hundreds of scouts waiting for me after the game all the time. Me and my dad were like that, you know what I mean? What's going on here? So, I had a little inkling then, being around about 14, that I was a good player. I, I believed in myself then. That's when the penny dropped, like, all because of all these scouts coming, phoning the house, waiting for me after the uh, the game on Penny Lane and all that, turning up with all new boots for me, coats, everything, trying to sign me. But my dad said, look, you're signing for no one yet. You're 14. You're too young. I just wanted to fucking sign for anyone. I wanted to sign for someone. I wanted to sign for someone, you know what I mean? So I can go and tell him, no, no, no. So we go around to all that. I've been in to see um, uh, Kenny Daglish. Me and my dad went into that, um, to Anfield to speak to Kenny Daglish. They offered me a great, a great, um, a great, a great deal, Liverpool. I loved it. I started going to Liverpool on a Tuesday night. So what what has happened is I'd go I'd go and train with Everton on a Monday, Liverpool on a Tuesday, Everton on a Wednesday and back to Melwood on a Thursday. And I'd be training and I loved it at Liverpool. I used to hate them growing up. I hated everything about them. Cause of like when I was growing up in Bailey I'd have loads of fights playing the Liverpool lads and we used to have a little game, they'd be mad and all that. So I really uh, I hated them. I didn't know what I hated about them. Cause when I got to Liverpool like Zag Leach, Phil Thompson, Sammy Lee uh, little John Ben, oh, he's not with us no more. People like that, good people, you know what I mean? I used to think, oh, God, I used to hate you, you know what I mean? But I didn't, I didn't. It was just growing up. It was just a Liverpool Everton thing. And I loved it, that Liverpool James. I really loved it. The, um, they didn't half look after me, Liverpool. They took me on a. Uh, remember when they got beat off Wimbledon? Yeah. Vinnie Jones <clears> and all that. Well, I, I travelled with the first team on the coach. Liverpool. What age were you? I was uh, six, 15. Then. I travelled downstairs in the hotel with me, uh, with me Liverpool trackie on. Don't be telling anyone about that as well. Sorry about <laughs> that, the blues, but I had the Liverpool trackie on. I was with the squads and all that. Proper looked after me. Uh, sees me mate Joe outside, Boggle, giving me ticket because I was with the lads, you know what I mean? I didn't need a ticket, but I gave Joe me ticket. His mate, he's been there following me football. He used to go to all the games and home and away all over the world, Joe. So I Tony. There's a couple of them who follow me everywhere and and um, yeah, and then and then in the summertime, in the summer I spent uh, six weeks at Man United, stayed in digs up there at Man United, same again, looked after me, offered me a great deal. It was time to make my mind up now. I'm, I'm leaving school, I need to I, it was time to sign for someone, you know. But I think the football the football people and everyone connected around Liverpool and Merseyside football at the time knew I was a mad Evertonian. My dad played. I was a mad Evertonian. The dreams, the lot, it just all made sense. So I signed for Everton, James. I signed for Everton, mate. And after to um, say goodbye to Liverpool and Man United and, and clubs like that, I just thought I just wanted to play for Everton. It was as simple as that. I, I was dreaming about them. He's had players, as I said. Was that an easy decision for you? Was Ferguson, he would have been in charge at Man well, U at that time? Alex eh? Ferguson, my, my dad went up be seeing him. They offered me a great, well, to be honest with you, I got the worst deal off Everton. I got the worst deal off Everton, Liverpool. What was it? Um, they offered me a three a, a year. I had to do a year YTS with them and then a three year professional contract. Same at Man United. They they offered me three years, bit of security. You know what I mean for yourself. Everton, I I, I had to do a, a full two year YTS. This was in the contract and a year on one year pro. So they knew because my family are Eddie and all that. I'd go up north to Belfield on a Saturday when I'd be playing for the A team or the B team when I was really young and they go ah. Oh, Billy loves it, he loves Evan, and that's it. He won't sign for no one. Everyone knew, you know what I mean? But do you think they think they used that as used you being a big Everton fan to absolutely. then fuck you for the contract? Absolutely, absolutely. And um I had no special treatments at Everton. I never seen our Kendall. I was I was getting dealt with by the uh, youth development officer called Graham Smith. He, he's lovely, Graham Smith. He was a top man. 
And um, you wouldn't see uh, Kendall or Larvey. The, the kids were always kept away from the <clears> first team. You wouldn't see none of that. And uh, like the way I was at Liverpool and Taglish called me into the uh, Anfield to give me a brand new pair of boots, sat me and my dad down for an hour, the same with um, Alex Ferguson. But at Everton, there was, there was no Al Kennel, I don't know where he was, but I was getting, I went through a science with, with the development officer, you know what I mean? So they probably already knew, yeah, that like I, was, uh, I wasn't I was going to sign for anyone else, you know? Your dad seemed a sensible man as well, that like, tried to guide you the right way did he not try and put the blockers on it was because his loyalty was with Everton they just well, went with the agreement my dad himself I'd always wanted to uh, he must have knew my dad my dad didn't really get in the um, really get in the way of anything like that you know what I mean he just like he just rolled with it because I was going to sign for Everton nothing was going to stop me he didn't say but to be honest my dad wanted me to sign for a lower league club someone like Oldham or Berry, I can remember Berry being in as well. A little club like that, he said, I'd have a better chance no making it in the first team. But I knew myself. I just knew I, I had this this fucking this thing inside me, and that was not what was going to stop me from making it, no matter where, what club I was at. You know what I mean, James? Yeah. I was I, I just had this burning desire. Was there a lot of hype before you made the first team debut for, from yourself? He was, I'd always put the pressure on myself, but I, I love pressure. I've always loved the pressure, especially on the pitch, you know what I mean, where I do my stuff. I mean, I'm more, I'm more, uh, I'm more fucking terrified now doing this. But we don't play, <laughs> but I'm playing football, yeah. you know what I mean, lads? I could go out and play in front of 50,000 every week, but sitting here with you, it's quite nerve-wracking. But um, no, there was never any 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 pressure on like on on me. It was all it was always off for the people. I was getting told, and there was rumors going around. He's going to make it. He's going to make it. Whatever that means, making it, making the grades. I don't know. I've never I've never known what that means. Like it was just a game of football to me. You know what I mean, Jay? No matter football's where I'm most comfortable. Mm -hmm. Whether there's under thousand, one thousand, two. I just love playing football. Don't care who for how wide the standard is or what. What was it like making your debut? Making me debut, whatever. Oh my God, it was just a fucking... That was the dream come through. It's it's surreal, man. I swear to you, James, it's surreal, mate. I, I think it was me... Um, I think it was me... Um, what was I going to say? Making me debut. Yeah, I'd been, I'd been um, in the reserves for about... Since I was about 16. Jimmy Gable used to play with players like... Um, Kevin Sheedy, they were like finishing the Everton careers then. And Kevin Ratcliffe, all the Everton legends, they were all like in the reserves now, mm -hmm. waiting to like go to other clubs or getting laid off or whatever. I was just getting new players in and all that. So I was lucky really to play with all these Everton legends in the reserves and they helped me out a lot. Sheedy, he, was, he always plays with me in the middle there. Kevin Ratcliffe, he always plays with me. Who else? Oh, they was great players, Marcus Sebton, um, just all that. So I was sort of, um, and I've been travelling with the first team, going to, they, they, they'd take me away when I was 15, you know, get me used to hotels and how it all went, they must have knew themselves, I was good enough to make it, whatever. So I, I sort of like, actually, I was sort of, uh, was, um, it was it was not on really, to be honest, because I've been in and around the first team since I was a kid. So when I actually made it, I think it was Coventry. I played a few pre-season games uh, against Bruzia, Munchie and Gladbach. I've been on tour to Ireland with them before the season started. And um, I would start buying like players. I remember players coming in there. Uh, Mick Milligan from Oldham, he paid a million pounds for him. He paid 750 grand for uh, Barry Orn from Southampton. And Neil McDonald's, I think he come from fucking Newcastle or somewhere. But they were all centre midfield. It's my position, you know what I mean? I thought, fucking hell, I've just signed for Everton. And now he's buying all these. So I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. It was only 16, 17. I've gone out of Howard's office, <laughs> knocked on the door. He said, come in. I thought, fucking hell. I said, he's walking a two I said, look, I said, what's how come you're buying all these players? You know what I mean? Look at me, I'm only 16. He says, oh, he started laughing. He said, sit down. I'm fucking maze up, you've come up here. He said, look, he said, don't be worrying. He said, you're doing fine. He said, I bought these players. 
in case anything happens to you. He said, these are going to be fine to play with you. So I thought, I thought oh, well, that's great then, you know what I mean? So I started the season, we played um, we played Coventry at home, we won 3-1, I think. And then and then I played the next game, the next game, and then I'm seven games in, still in the first team, couldn't believe it. What's that feeling like for you? Unbelievable, unbelievable. Coming from, I could hear all my mates in the stands shouting me. Honest to God, uh, the crowd took to me great, they're singing my name. I, I loved every minute of it, James, I really did, honest to God. So the big game, seven games in, the Merseyside derby. Liverpool are flying, never forget it. Who did they have, McManaman? Barnes, uh, McManaman, Redknapp, Redknapp Hutchinson, Grobler, Steve Nichol. Mark Walters, who else? Mick Mast, he was strong. Liverpool have always been strong. It's tough playing against them, it really is. Maybe you let them play, you'll get you'll get you've just got to get stuck into them. So I played against Liverpool loads of time. B team, A team, U team, reserves. I'd never been beat off them. I hated them, you know what I mean? It was like it was more than a footy game. It was more that it was always more than a football game to me. I hate to get and beat that. It takes me days getting over it. These are even playing for the school, playing for the Swallows, playing for Everton was no different. I hate the tour to get and beat. Used to like keep me awake at night, big time, honest to God, lads. Still today, if I'm going to play a game of 40, I don't care whether I'm playing with three year old kids or 30. I'll kick anything, you know what I mean, still. So, anyway, the big games come around within the. Um, we we used to always go to the um, it was a night game that game it was the first live Sky game on a Monday night that 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 derby game and remember we were in a, uh, an hotel the old up the M sixty two called um, what was the hotel called the Lodgewood Mill the Lodgewood Mill it's called it's off the M sixty two they were in there anyway so we've been in Belfield in the morning nine ten we've got on the coach we've gone to the hotel and we're having a bit of breakfast pre pre-match meal and that and uh, we've gone for a walk the team used to have your breakfast now you go for a walk no walk or off and that and I was I was in Colin have shouted me over he said you're playing tonight I thought shit you know what I mean but like thinking this I couldn't wait to get to the fucking room to phone me dad I'm playing I'm playing all right lads my dad's nervous to being gone yeah, my dad was working at the time. He never even he, he he never even used to go to the games to watch me. My dad he only went a couple of games. He went that game, the derby game, that night with me mum, um, and that was that that was the game that just sticks out in my mind. It was a great game anyway, but to actually beat Liverpool, and the way we did coming back from one nil down, it was unbelievable. That's unbelievable feeling. I'll never ever. That was that was that was my dream. That was it. That that was it. And then and then um, I played the um, I played. I think I played the first fourteen games of that season. And uh, you see, because he was stuffing the papers. My dad played twelve games for Everton's first team. So I'd done a little side bet with my dad. He says if you play more games, then maybe to have a little pounds on it. You know what I mean? A fucking pound. It was five of them, man. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd, he'd still do things like that. We'd still have a little pound bet. I was on a few quiz at the time. It was a little pound note, it would be a little pound. And we'd have a bet and all that. So, all right. so he said, if you, you know, if you, if you play more first team games than me, you know, well, I've done that in the first season. I played, I played the first 14, James, and my legs started hurting me. I was um, I was in for it. The, um, they, they were killing me. There was no way uh, my feet were going numb. There was no circulation, and I was doing that much training. And my calves were going massive, and the skin it was in your muscles are in like a sausage skin, yeah. And the muscle was growing, but the skin wasn't. So I was in. For, I needed big operations and that. So I played fourteen games. So um, I've been to see specialists about my legs. Yeah, you need operations. So there was. Uh, I think it was the last game of the season. We were playing Southampton away. I couldn't play. I've been told of this um, United operation, the last game of the season. So um, Kendall phoned me. I'm in the house. I'm starting to get depressed now. You know what I mean? I've got. I've never been injured in my life. I've never been injured in all my life playing football. I need the. I've been Evans first team now, and I need a fucking operation, big operation now as well on my two legs. 
devastated. So I'm in the house and that, and uh, the phone's gone. Billy, our Kendall on the phone. So it's all right, boss. He said, look, he says, I'm going to take you in the squad tomorrow. He said, why don't you come in and that? I said, I'm in the squad. He went, yeah, he said, I'll speak to you tomorrow. He said, uh, we're leaving at 10 o'clock, Southampton, lad. Get all your, like, you're going away stuff and all that. So I thought, oh, that's all right, you know what I mean? At least I'm bound with the lads and that. It was like, I missed it, you know what I mean? I was fucking, it's on my head. And it was just like, I was flying and then the injuries and then I was stuck in the house all the time and going away. Well, anyway, he brought me with me. So he said, look, he's, he's named me a sub. I would name me a sub and I'm thinking, fuck, how the fuck am I sub? The boss, he a lovely fella, that was on a proper fucking one of us, James, little sc proper scouser, he sounds, he loves scousers and that, he's a belter. So uh, I was, I didn't realise in my contract, it was like, if I play 15 games or more, I get an extra 25 grand. That was in my contract, well I didn't know about that, I wasn't asked about my contract, I was just fucking flying, and I? I didn't, I just signed the thing. And uh, But that's what was in my contract, now I wouldn't have known about that. So what he done hours was he waited for two minutes to go, put me on. I couldn't walk, I couldn't run from here to you. That's how bad my legs were. And I'm still not I'm still not on after the pitch. He said, Do you know why I put his arm around me? I am still thinking, why has he put me on? I couldn't run, Jamie. My legs were killing me. He said, You forgot to he said, Have you looked in your um, in your contract? I said, No, I said no. He said, Well, he said, that's your 15 game now. He said, go and have a look in your contract, 25 grand. He put me on for two minutes. That's you know what I mean? Yeah, he's done me a yeah, life favour then. So, um, yeah. What was that team like? Who was in it? Mo Johnston, Southall. Yeah. Who was in the Everton team that year? Ian Snowden, Barry Orn, John Eberl, Neville Southall, Andy Inchcliffe. Um, Gary Ablett Peter Beardsley Beardsley man he's a player. Beardsley unbelievable unbelievable I can remember the first day he come through the door in Belfield man oh the, the level went up you know it was another level it was great for me because I could play at that level you know what I mean what he was what he was bringing to the table you know it, it was just he just freshened the whole place up he was a proper proper professional mate Every time you'd travel away with the Everton's first team, the first thing that'd be on the coach would be the ale, the lager, the wine, nothing on the way home and that. But when Peter come, he changed all that. He started bringing a fucking big kit bag, a big Asics bag, big as the table there, full of like all your chicken foods and your waters. This is before anyone... Even, in that case. Yeah, this is before anyone was even on it, big bags of fruit and that. We all laughed. Look at him, bringing all this grand microwave chicken pasta, this, that, and the other fruit, bottles of water. He just changed the, the whole thing, mate. And that's how it should have been from day one. But um, uh, he was unbelievable. And I, 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 as a fella as well as a person, Peter, he was just he was just unbelievable, honest. He was, I know, what a player. Yeah. What a player, man. Every morning in uh, in training, he'd just be doing stuff, you know. He mm. was he was unbelievable, mate. Uh, Peter, Peter Beasley, man, he's a good friend, yeah. So see, after that season, Bill, what what, what was the, the hate for you then? Was everybody saying, this kid's going to be a superstar, he's the next big thing, after the six, 15 games you played? Well, it was after the derby, really. My, my you get minded a match that derby? Uh, yeah, yeah, my life changed after that derby to, like, superstars. I was, I was fucking like one of the Beatles in the end, you know what I mean? Walking around the city and everyone wanted to bid at me. And, and I loved it, James. I, I loved everything about being a, a professional footballer. And then uh, I lo absolutely loved it, mate. I loved the fame. I loved everything about it. Most of, most importantly, I was playing for Everton. I was playing for Everton's first team. It was me. It was me wildest dream come through. So you can imagine. And then it was them injuries that I was going on about before with me, uh, me shins, me shin splints, and me calves and that. Was your contract still the same, the two years and then the, the extra year, or did you get a new no, contract? No, I, 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 they didn't, they scrapped the, they scrapped the two years, they just, they just gave me a three-year contract after my first year YTS, because mm. I've done well, you know what I mean? And uh, I went upstairs, right after that derby game, I went, I went from £35 a week to like a few grand a week. After, so you were only on 35 quid a week? I was on 35 pounds a week. As soon as the whistle went, I've gone in to get changed and I would said to me, you wanted upstairs, go on, congratulations. So I said, where am I going? 
it was like that, you know, I was, it was not was fucking, not was settling like United or, mm. or Liverpool, everything was up in the air and everything, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. So I said, well, what stairs am I going up to? He, so he's kind of, he didn't even bring me up, you know. He just said, look, see the stairs there, go up to the, the, uh, the director's room up there, big fucking room in Goodison, and I'm knocking, and I'm opening the door, there's no one in there. So I went back down, he said, did you do that? I said, there's no one up there. So he took me up, Howard into the the director's room all is all the directors the chairman and all that so after that game from being on a little 35 quid a week i was on a couple of few grand then you know what i mean oh just literally as soon as the whistle had gone so i was on a like few quid then straight, yeah. straight after were that were you drinking or anything at that time bro well no 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 the drinking started well, do you know what? To be honest, James, all my mates and that were all going out. They were all going out 16, you know, as you do, 16, 17, 18. I'll, I never, and I didn't used to like, I didn't like drinking at all. I, I was just into my fitness. I was boxing, training, I was playing for Evan. It didn't bother me. I didn't go out. No way. Just proper, into proper fitness fanatic. And the girl who I was with at the time, she was a, fit, a, a fitness instructor, so... The drinking and all that, it didn't even come into it, not and all that. What happens was um, when I went and got my operations, the the, the, um, the specialist said, look, you won't be playing for six months. It's going to take bum and your rehabilitation. So I'm looking at 12 months, so I got depressed. I didn't know what depressed was then. I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't know what was going on, the feelings I was getting. I was just sad and down and, and fucking big scars in my legs I have 50 stitches in that one 50 stitches in that one right down my shins the two of them on crutches wheelchair fucking so anyway I slipped into depression and um, started drinking I started going out only the the, the night out you know on the few nights out and now I went to state and all that this nightclub everyone was raving about I went there a few times. I can remember being in there with all my stitches in my legs and I bumped into this like little fucking iron thing off the pillar and split all my fucking, all my stitches come out and all that, all that, all, I done all that. Um, and then I, I, I liked it. I liked the feeling. I liked the feeling. I liked the way it made me feel. The alcohol, it, it's, it's sort of like, I was, I was always under pressure. I was under pressure and I was thinking, I'll never play again. I feel terrible. I, uh, it was the first time I'd ever had an operation. I was putting weight on. I was getting deep proud thoughts. I'll never play for Everton again. All that was, it was all, all negative thoughts in my mind. The depression was going thicker than that. And then the only enjoyment I got was going out with my mates and that. I absolutely loved it. I'd never been out. I'm like about 19, now nearly 20. I'd never been out. I'd never had a bevy or nothing. Starts going out with me mates, getting a few, you know, there's always a few beds there and blah, blah, blah. And then, and then I can't even remember. I can't even remember having my first line. I've always thought, when did you, when did you first start having your first line of coke? Well, I can't remember. I've tried to fucking think for years. Must have been, well, it was obviously while I was drunk, but I can't, I've never thought where, where, where it actually was. And um, I can remember I tried it. And I woke up the next day feeling fucking rough as fuck. I thought, never again with that. It just wasn't me, you know what I mean? I was just into fitness. I remember waking up fucking rough as fuck. And then I'd have to go into Belfield to get treatment because of my injuries. And and then it just snowballed from there, James. Um, I started going out more. I had a few quids. Um, started fucking... Getting all kinds of female attention off beards and whatnot, carrying on behind me beards back and that. Um, and then it just went fucking from bad to worse. I was just out, so everything didn't give a fuck about the I didn't want to play anymore, to be honest with you. I'd stay off work. Um, I'd be staying off for two days, three days. I'd have Kendall on the phone, the club on the phone. Sometimes I wasn't even in the house when they were phoning on me dad. I'd be looking everywhere for me, fucking me mad. He'd have the air to see him out looking all over the place for me. I'd just be fucking in some gaff, wherever. Off me cake, didn't give a fuck what was going on in the world. So it was just sort of like, sort of running away from people and things and stuff, you know. I just wanted to be on my own. It was, it was a terrible time. 
It was terrible times. Did you know at that time, did, in your mind, did you think you would get it back and play again, or were you just yeah. getting so far lost that you, there was no way well, out? Well, 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 yeah, I thought to myself, because he had it in the back of my mind, the doctor saying 12 months, so I was thinking to myself, well, you've got 12 months to fuck about it. Free you know pass. I mean? <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and then I always thought to myself, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get back. I've never been, I, I, I didn't realise how hard it is to get fit again once you've had an operation. It's fucking absolutely murder. You don't realise that. Well, I never anyway, I, I struggled. Because in this time, by the time I was supposed to be fit, I was in, I was a fucking mess, you know what I mean? I was staying off. The, and then the, the, the coaches, I can remember the coaches, Simon, he was running around Belfields about fucking three minutes too late and one o'clock and then they're thinking, what's up with Billy? You know, he's gone from like, I was always the hardest trainer. I was always first to second in the race, you know what I mean? To come and last, couldn't breathe. I think, oh, what's up with him? What's up with him? Then the piss test come in then. They wanted uh, to have a piss test and that, and this, that, and the other. And I can remember, um, I can remember it being a fucking a relief when when I got found out, you know, because it didn't, I, I always had me in, he had me in the office saying to me, you know, what's up, you're okay, and uh, I had me chance to tell him then, look, I've been fucking snorting cocaine, I've been, I've been out, I've been this, that and the other, but I never, I just, I, I lied to them, I told them uh, um, I was depressed because of my injuries, and uh, I wasn't travelling with the first team, I don't feel a part of it no more, and this, that and the other, and I, uh, he put his arm around me and all that. I said, look, got me back and tried to get me back and coming in with the first team and this, that and the other. And then I was I, I was a bit far gone then. I was drunk all the time and fucking wasn't turning in and all that. And that's when the drug test started coming in and, and I got found out then. And uh, uh, what happened then? I got what I went to the fucking disorders at all for me, Evan. They put me in a rehab. What was that like? Oh, it was terrifying, James. I was 19. Was 19 years of old. It was in uh, Hale and Wimslow in Cheshire. Lovely place. Um, the Priory Hospital it was. But it wasn't for me. It was for fucking like. Um, it was just wasn't for me. There was no sports psychology like there is now today. It was nothing like that. It was just like group therapy and I'm sitting there with like old people, 70, 60, 50, who've been hiding bottles of scotch in the backyard and fucking uh, vodka all over the house and all that. Well, that wasn't me, you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, I'm saying to them, look, I'm, I think I'm in the wrong place here. This is not for me, this. Oh, can I, I only go out and have a couple of days on it and then a couple of days off it, you know, like binge drinking and all that. I didn't understand it all. It was pro it was it was the wrong place for me still even today. Thinking back now it was proper the wrong place. There was no there was nothing there like for young sports people or, or nothing. Tony Adams ended up doing uh, that that thing, didn't he? Addi addict or something yeah. addict. Like Charlie he was on, yeah. That's that's more like what what I needed at the time, mm. you know what I mean. But there was none of that. So anyway, uh, that was only about six seven months after that derby game. All this was happening. That's how quick I lost the plot. That's how quick I went from zero to zero with the drinking and the depression and the drugs and that. It was a terrible time. And uh, Are you sniffing every day, bro. I was snorting coke every day. Every time I was over, the only time I wasn't snorting coke at that time was when I was asleep. Honestly, it got that bad that I wasn't even going out. I was just getting the dealers to me mars, fucking having the dealer climbing up on the thingy old to pass me, posting it where my mars and dad, all that was going on while my mars and dad were in bed. I just locked myself in my room. Six months I was in there. Didn't come out of my room. What was your man and dad saying at the time? Because they must have started seeing telltale signs at something, oh, was it, they right? were up the wall with me, James. Honest to God, I've put them through fucking... It's my biggest depression what, 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 about my mum and dad at the time. Um, they're, just, they're just a lovely couple, my man and dad. It wasn't no, like, shouting. Or, my, my dad just wouldn't speak to me, and he was just devastated, my dad, you know. My dad couldn't even go out the house because he was getting asked to buy me. I was Billy and he was sick of it, you know what I mean? Everywhere he went, so my dad even had to stay in for a couple of my dad didn't bother going out. It affected them bad. 
terrible, so selfish, and it kills me. It kills me now to think like what it like I've done, you know. Kills me, mate. Absolutely. So. So anyway, um, that's the effects of addiction, though, Bo. That you've got to remember the memories you did give them. That any school kid, there's not many people get to walk through at Goodison Park and fucking get man of the match in a derby game. That like, that's the the problem with addiction. But for you to get an addiction at 19 years old shows you the power of the disease, the power of the escape. That like, it's absolutely. You're not the only mate. one, mate. That like, it's absolutely horrendous that addiction, mate. See when you try to get back, did the, did the football teams and that know once you came out? How long did you do rehab for? I'd done rehab, I'd done rehab and nursery. So what happens was I've gone to the, I've gone to put me in the priory Everton to get me all cleaned up and all that. But they 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 sack me, they sack me. Because what happens was I was went to the, um, I think I was retired. I'm not sure or he went somewhere else. But anyway, this Mike Walker, he, he got the Everton job. The fella from Norwich. He got the job and um, I'd been off for two weeks. I'd been off for two weeks drinking and fucking carrying on like fucking George Best. Fucking um, Colin Harvey come the house. She phoned the house. She said, I'm picking you up in the morning. We've got to go and pick the new manager up, Mike Walker. He was staying in a hotel in the city centre. So we went and got Mike Walker in the morning and like, I always remember him saying to me, look, Billy, he says, I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make a drinker. I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on? I don't know that, like James. <laughs> fucking as fuck. I couldn't get what he was going on about, to be honest with you. And like, he didn't know me as a person. He didn't know what I'd been through. I mean, anyone could see. I was 18. I was on fucking. I was got. I've just gone from there to there. Everyone could see something was up. You know what I mean? I'm fucking depressed to death. I was just waiting for a bit of help off someone. Never ever come. So he's the manager, yeah. He's come in as the manager. The train for the first week, he was made up with me and fucking put my heart and soul into it. But then, as I said, the all addiction again. As soon as I started feeling all right, I started thinking again. So he didn't even give me one chance, him. He just had enough. He said, You've had enough chances and sack me. That was it, sack me, Mike Walker. So I was fucking devastated, crying my eyes out. Um, goes home. So, no matter I got in, there's like there's a few Premier League teams and first division teams and all falling in the house. They all wanted to sign me. I'm thinking, fuck it now. You know what I mean? So Teddy Darricott and Al Everton play. He was like youth development officer at, at Man City. He's phoned me. He's phoned the house. All right, Billy. It's Teddy. All right, Teddy. He said, look. He said, Man City. Do you want to take it up there? So I thought I played that Man City a few times for Everton reserves and that lovely little grounds and all that. I thought it's a bit of me, that Man City. Yeah, definitely. I said, Terry, fucking son. He said, Well, look, I've been on the phone to Brian Orton there, and we're going to grab it in the morning, take it up to Manchester. And uh, I said, I'm a train, and he said, Yeah, have you got your boots? I said, No, I've left them all. And he said, Don't worry about it. We'll get your boots. I said, All right. So I'm waiting there. In the morning, I'm going to Man City. I was made up telling me, Ma, look, I've got one. Don't worry about it, Mum. I'm going to Man City now, girl. I'll sort it out. I'll get my head together. Don't worry about it. So I'm waiting for Terry to pick me up. The phone goes, Billy, it's Terry. He said, Oh, you can't come to Man City. I says, Why? What's what do you mean? He said, Everton won a million pounds for you. I said, I mean, they've just sacked me, haven't they? He said, yeah, but they still hold your registration. He said, can't do nothing, mate, and all that. And I was devastated. I thought, what the fuck? And then I'm starting to think then, oh, they must want me back, you know what I mean? You know, I knew I was going into this fucking, this rehab and all that. So anyway, Colin Harvey was coming up and Paul Power to train me in the rehab in, um, in, in, in the Priory. So then... Uh, Colin come up one morning. He said, I need to speak to you and all that. That's when he told me. He said, look, you're going to hold them. I had no say in the matter, no signing on fee, but they're going to like give me the same couple of bob I've been getting out of heaven. So it all made sense. He said, Joe Royal, he said, you'll love him. He's one of my best mates. This is Colin. I trusted Colin Harvey. Lovely fella, Colin. One of the best fellas in football for me. And um, he said, you'll love Joe Bill. He said, honest to God, you couldn't be going to the better fucking club. Honest to God, lads. So I said, sounds old as this then. I just wanted to get back playing. They were in the lower di another lower division, but they had a great, gra a great ground, great fan base. 
And I went up there, Joe Royal picking me up, my last day in the rehab, and I flew to Roslo with him to meet the first team. They were already there. It's a good chat with Joe, and I loved him straight away. He yeah, looked after me. Yeah, I ended up buying a house in Oldham. I went up there, um, bought an house in Oldham. Right at the top of Barnes, you think, oh, me and my bird, the bears who was with us at the time, she's, um, so, so, so I've been in the rehab, been in Oldham, I was doing well, I was getting man the matches up there, me and my bears have bought an house and that, a nice house and that. She even got a work change from Liverpool up and up to Oldham. She worked for BT at the time, the bears I was with. Um, and that lasted about fucking, lasted about, um, about a year. Stayed sober for a year, doing as well. Oh man, there was this fucking booze at, there was this pub, James, it must have been the oldest pub in Great Britain. <laughs> I know the oldest pub in Great Britain's in Glasgow, yeah, isn't it? Because yeah. being outside that little, pub, little hole in the yeah. house, being there. There's not many fucking booze there haven't been, to be honest. But anyway, <laughs> listen, this, 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 this fucking pub, I think it was called the White Horse or something, that's how old, it was stinking. And for some reason, lads, every time I pull into my estate, I clock this, this booze, I didn't even know whether it was open. This is addiction for you. It's playing already, playing on my mind. You've done well now. You're fucking your back on your feet. Go and have a pint. This is what the D, this the old thing on the shoulders is telling me. And I'm having murder with myself every day. You can't, you can't. You're going to throw all this away. And all the people who've fucking helped you build your mum and dad knows I'm talking to myself out loud all the time. But he's about like my mum and dad. And, you know, I can't put my family through this again, mate. There's not a chance. Any. I battles with a James for the bar. Fucking hell. For a good couple of months anyway. I can always remember me bear going back to Liverpool. She was going to stay in the Mars one night and I thought, right, bang, there it is. There's me chair back on my head then. Well, she's gone, go and have a few pints, you know what I mean? Just that. Uh... So I went and I did this. She's gone back home to stay in the Mars for the night. I flew round and fucking couldn't wait for her to go. I flew round the booze and have I ordered the pints. The, the only person in there. The worst pub in the fucking world. The pint looked horrible and everything. Kind of stood. I sat there. We go like that with the alpine. Get all the froth off. Messed around. I messed around with it for about a good 20 minutes before they had to drop. I was shaking. I knew I was relapsing, you know what I mean? Because I'd just come out of the rehab and they were telling me all about this. One's too many. A thousand's never enough. But you thought, I thought, I'll be all right. It's a couple of fucking bevies, you know what I mean? There you go. I had it. I had that. I had that one drink, and I tell you what, mate, a thousand wasn't enough. Cause from there, I just went down the same slope, quicker, faster, yeah, quicker this time. Bang. Bigger depression as well, cause you know you fucked. Yeah. Up. So, I mean, and then <clears> I can always remember uh, going in, cause Graham Sharp had just got the uh, the manager's job then at Oldham, and he was a boss mate of mine. Colin Harvey had just come from Evan to be Sharp. He's number two. <laughs> So, and I like Stuart Barlow, Neil Moore, Ian Snowden, loads of Everton players come to Oldham. It was just like being in Belfields, if you like. Yeah. There was loads of us. There was me, Sharpie, Neil Poynton, Snods, Neil Moore, Stewie Barlow, Steve Redmond, all scouts as well, you know what I mean? Nick Henry. As a new house, at the fucking lot, lad. I lost it all again. Everything again, same thing. House, bed. Back around Liverpool, fucking snorting coke, looking everywhere for it, staying up, wasn't going up to training, didn't go to my house for about two months, didn't go finish with it, um, and I'd go up to my house, and he had, remember them old phones with the little tape recorders in, mm. and I'd press play all the time, I'd be uh, Sharpie in the Scottish accent, pal, come in, pal. You know what I mean? I'd fucking, uh, I'd stay, I'd all out. Me and Nick Henry had a good relationship in the middle and we were doing well in, in, in uh, at Oldham as well at the time. And it was just that relapse again, having that one bevy again, taking my eye off the ball, thinking you could do us all and forgetting about what I've been through. Selfish again, addiction again for you. And then uh, just bang right back on that slope. Couldn't believe it, mate. Absolutely couldn't believe it. And I can remember Sharpie and Colin fucking, uh, you know, he wasn't happy with me and that. 
And I thought to myself, do you know what, before, I can answer, honestly, God, James, I thought to myself, do you know what, before, I didn't want to do sharp, he said, and didn't, he, he's only just got the manager's job, he was putting a little team together, and I was staying off work, no proper fucking doing his head in, and Colin wasn't happy. And I'd had all this at Evan, and I thought, you, before it goes any further, I'm retiring. How about that? To myself. I thought, you fucked it again. You're doing everyone's head in around you, me, me family, everyone who cares about me. So do you know what, lad? I'm retiring. And I did. I retired. I was 21. I'd, I'd had enough, James, I thought. It wasn't just so much for me. It was the people around me. I was letting them down, left, right and centre. didn't mean to. It was the last thing I wanted to do was let me fucking mad me poor man, me dad down. All my managers, everyone who put any fucking Colin Sharpie, everyone who put it, I just felt as though I let, I'm going to let them all down again and I'm going to go through all that again. So I just went home. I said to me ma, do you know what, mum? I said, I'm not going to. Me ma wasn't asked. Me ma wasn't bothered. She just wanted me normal. She wanted me, me a lot back, you know what I mean? And, I said, look, I'm not going to play no more. My dad says, that it, lad. I said, that's it. He said, sounds, give me a big hug. And that was it. I just thought, I can't put you all through all this. I can't keep putting you through it all, you know what I mean? Because uh, I'm with the injuries and everything else. It, it was fucking tough, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a tough life being a football, James. It's not easy. You've got to sacrifice, and I mean everything, to succeed. And it did, I done it in the beginning, and uh, as I said, I was just letting too many people down all the time. So I just walked, I just walked out on old and walked out, left me house, left everything, I just walked, come right back to Liverpool and went right round the bends again. Just, just proper round the bends, I was going out, staying out, all kinds of different drugs, actually tablets, fucking trips, uh, coke, you name it, man. And I, I just wasn't going home. I was just there. Uh, I can always remember me say, self saying, "Well, look, you've made this bed now, lads. You need to. Uh, you're gonna like line it. You know what I mean?" We have a suicide, bro. Sorry. We have a suicide. Tried to take me life. Fucking another story, James. Um, I had enough, mate. I'd, uh, I got in my Mars one night. Um, I've been on a fucking three day bender, proper coke bender. Fucking oh man. Coming down off, I've got to me mask. They were getting fed up in me now. They were just about letting me in the house. I was knocking all hours, different girls all the time in me mask house. They'd had enough of me. So, uh, get in there, she, me mask, me mask let me in. It's about fucking four o'clock in the morning. She's gone back to bed, me man. And I thought I've had a fucking enough fact. Just couldn't stop snorting cocaine. I couldn't as much as I wanted to. I just. It just ends up on it. Every time I got bored or any time my phone when you coming out, I was fuck off, I was out, I was on it. And I was sick of it. So I've got in there. And my ma had this like cubby hole, like like the lecky cubby. And it was just because my ma and my ma's sisters and all that, they were all ill, nobody for seeing me at the smoking and all that down here. So this cubby was absolutely chocker with different tablets for breathing, for fucking all kinds, for the chest, the lot. I've gone in there off my cake one morning, four o'clock, my mum just gone to bed and he had every tablet. And uh, my mum was there to commotion, know what I mean? She comes down, she's back, she's screaming, what the fuck, what have you done, Bill? She shouting my dad up now, fucking the next minute, there's paramedics at the door, they've took me. I mean, my chest is getting pumped in the royal air. They gave me fucking, uh, they, gave me, they made me drink this charcoal. Charcoal will to flush everything out and the like it sort of goes in like into the like a brick inside of this charcoal and it drags you have a poo and it's like fucking like a brick. It's like giving fucking bear to the baby <laughs> calf. So um to flush you all out and all that. So we've done all that. Just absolutely terrible times, lad. Trying to um so anyway, the, the, all the doctors in the royal are asking me what I've took, what asking me man, what's he took me man's gone? I don't know, he's just dead, he's at hundreds, he, I don't know what. She, so they wanted to know what sort of tablets, the vet and all that. They were doing all tests on me and that. So you know what he said to me? This is on me mind, this. The doctor come to see me later on in the day when they found out what it, what it actually had. The doctor said to me, you'd have lived till you were about 200, you know, you, you vet all your mind's breathing tablets. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to fucking do myself in it and all kinds of breathing tablets, uh -huh. honest to God, lads. Yes, all my mum's breathing tablets, just a big cry for help. 
it was a big cry for help, mate. But I'd really had enough, man. That's where that cocaine takes you. It, it brings you to your knees, mate. I'm telling you now. And over the last 20 years, Bo, and once you retired, and do you, do you feel like a failure as well that you never succeeded to the heights that everybody knew you could believe? Because what's that quote? I read a quote. I think you were in a shop and you says to the guy in the shop, do you know who I am? And the guy says, no, but I know who you could have been. Or he says, yes, but I know who you could have been. It's, it's your name beside the quote. Which is fucking deep, man. Like you says, I think you were arguing with him. Every says, day. Every day, James, over the last 30 years, mate. There's not a day that hasn't gone back that I've, I've regretted. It's not like, because I wanted to win things forever. I wanted to win the <laughs> FA Cup. I wanted to beat Liverpool at Wembley. I wanted to play for England. I got England caps at under 21 level. Uh, I wanted to play in European Championships, just like Gerrard and Rooney and Carragher and, and Mac Manaman. My mate, he went to my school, Steve, he's one of my good mates. So I wanted to do all that, you know what I mean? So I've got major regrets, I've got hundreds of regrets, and that's one of my biggest ones. I wanted to win all kinds forever, and I wanted to be like Kevin Ratcliffe. I wanted to win stuff, man. I wanted them European nights when I used to watch them, Everton playing Rapid Vienna and all, all that, mate. So I wanted my life just being full of regrets, mate, to be honest with you. Do you think Everton could have done more for you? See, my thing with Everton is I should have just, at the time, there was a bad drinking culture in football, right? In the 90s, it, it, was, it was every club you go to, there was drinkers, there was players lounge where you go for a drink, but Everton, Everton was another. It was another matter. It, it was it was it was more than just the fucking. I mean, I no disrespect to Howard and that, but I would love to bevy, didn't he? And if you were in the first team, you'd have to have a bevy. You couldn't just go and drink at Orange. You know, it's already being warned about that, or you won't like you if you fucking. Because I was just drinking a black and lemonade the first few times I went out with the first team. And I think it was Dave Watson. He was only messing like, but it stuck in my head. He said, oh, he won't like you. You know, you better have a fucking shanty or something. You know what I mean? It always stuck in my head that. I think, oh, I better have a fucking shanty, yeah. You know what I mean? And like everywhere, every other week, we'd be, we'd be going somewhere, like a, a, a funeral, one of Everton side actors, loads of booze. And I remember playing away somewhere and uh, we're on our way home from, uh, I think it was fucking Spurs, we'd just played away. And we've come off the uh, the motorway on on the um, what's it called up and fucking um, well we wasn't the M62 anyway it was the other way by Ainsley we're coming through that way and um, I'm thinking where the fuck are we going we were going to the opening night of a nightclub in Liverpool one o'clock in the morning we turns up all the Everton and our trackies all VIPs off it was just stuff like that it wouldn't happen today do you know what I mean it was all we're hours. It was drink, drink, drink. You know, he loved a bevy. He loved all the team to have a bevy. He fucking... It was one of them. I just wanted to be one of the lads, you know what I mean? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. I fucking... So, I have been... I've been I'm still bitter today about it because it, like, just, just sort of left me out of it, you know, being a being 18. You, you know, he should, I should have just been left out of the, the, the booze and... Being eighteen, that's that's me now as as a forty eight year old sober, thinking back on me on my life and my career. Just a kid as well at twenty one. See twenty one, even when you retired, was it still in your mind that I'm going to come back? Or was that just you yeah, made up yeah. your mind? I'd always had loads of time. I, no, when I actually bump made me minds up, then I, I, that was it. I really believed I wasn't going to play, and I didn't play. I didn't play for years. I went and parties. I know it's all the drugs, I mean, I've been, I've been everywhere with the lads and all my mates were doing well and that. And we'd, we'd be all over the Ibitas, fucking um, Thailand, full moon parties, Vegas. We've been absolutely everywhere, but I can't remember the thing because I was just on the bend yeah. on the drugs. I wouldn't go nowhere, but I was, a bit, I was a, ch a bit of Charlie, you know what I mean? Do you think a lot of people used you, though, because of the superstardom that you had at that season to then everybody want a piece of you giving you free booze, free Charlie, yeah, free Yeah, 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 all that. You get all that when you're in the, uh, the, the, uh, the spotlight. Like You get everything free. It's all free coke and... People want to be with you and sort of like have a line with you and all that, you know what I mean? I fucking, 
I've just been getting dragged in toilets in Liverpool for 25 years because I have a line with people, you know what I mean, be made up and I I'd think, oh, he's going to tell tomorrow I've had snorting last night with Billy Kenny. I knew all that was going on anyway, but as I said, I was fucking out on the bends. I was out, I was drunk and all kinds of that, mate, mm. proper. I always love the regret, especially with addictions, but I know your dad was a big part of your life. What age did your dad pass away, Bill? No, my dad's still here. What, was he, who was it, your mum that passed ma, away? My ma, my ma, my ma died about eight years ago. And um, it's, it's just mad, me because all that, all that time when she was alive, I tried to get my head together, I'd, stop, I'd tried to stop drinking, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, not even for my mother, not even for myself. Fucking, I was also once, also was doing was drinking and partying and being out and about and fucking hell, like the drinking, mate. I can remember one time getting, listen to this, James. I've gone, I always, I always used to go to the pub in Liverpool called the Camfields to meet my uncle Rocky. He worked in town, on the stalls. And he used to get off the bus right facing the, the Camfield 10 to 6 every night and I'd have him a pint there. I was always promised myself not to have any Charlie Rocky never has. I was trying to wrap myself around people who didn't fucking trying to be like and, uh, wrap myself around people who didn't have drugs and all that at the time. So Rocky was perfect. He was dead funny. I loved Rocky. He's passed away now, bless him. So uh, one night, he did the bar girls gone, come on, it's built Rocky, it's, it's half ten the night, she last orders, whatever. And I've got like that fucking I'm dying for the fucking line, you don't know what I mean? Dying to fucking get on the Charlie. So I did the phone some, I got some. And then I'm getting thrown out of the booze and out. So I've got on my phone like that and I'll fucking birds numbers come up in my phone. I won't mention the name because I'm embarrassed about anyway, and I'll fucking bird so phones just says, all right, girl. Yeah, Who's that? I said, it's Billy. She said, oh, fucking hell. She said, oh, you're going to be made up when you find out where I am. Anyway, long story short, she was only a madam for I, an, I, an, I, an I fucking class prostitute yeah. fucking place in Southport. So I've gone there, fucking hell. I was there before I put the phones on. I'll be there now, bang. Got a taxi to Southport. Gets in there and I'm in there. Charlie fucking birds everywhere, fuck all on, big fridge, loads of ale, so I'm in there and I'll party and, and there's a Scottish lad in the corner and my phone's gone and it's me mate from Tenerife, Foxy his name was. So I've said, all right, Fox, so the little jock in the corner's gone, Bala, is that Foxy from, from the sunny side? I said, oh, you won't know him, lads. I said, it's just me mate. He went, no, I... He said, does he know thingy yo? Oh, another lad saw us. I said, oh, hang on. I said, Foxy, yeah, some Scottish lads want you there. One thing led to another. This Scottish lad said to me, hey, do you fancy coming to Glasgow with me? I've been out for two nights now. Don't forget, he only went to fucking cut the, the, the local in, in Anfield. I'm in, I'm in Southport now. So the next minute, long story short, I've ended up in the back of a fiesta with this lunatic going to Glasgow, snorting our plums off all the way up the M6, James. I only went out for the fucking pint by my mass. I'm in Glasgow now. So we've got to buy Glasgow Green. There's a booze and all that. So it goes with this lad, Ozzy, his name is. Have you heard of him? No. Um, think your Orsfeld, Orsfeld's his name is. Once for two murders in uh, Scotland at the time. And I didn't know this. So we've got to some booze in, in uh, Glasgow. And them all pubs and all them all windows with the, the metal going through them and you can just see outlines and I've seen him. He, he's been shouted out on the doorstep, this kid who we went with. And there's fucking murder going on, you know what I mean? And I'm just paranoid, I'm me, bro. I'm paranoid, me. I'm just, what's going on here? He comes back in, he goes, Bill, come on, let's get off and all that. So I said to Morsey, what the fuck? Where have you brought me up here for? I said, what am I doing here? He said, no, he said, that cheeky cunt. Says he's just put two in my head and I'm dead in Liverpool and I've come all the way. Just I said, so you've brought me all the way to fucking Glasgow to sell some lad, you're not fucking dead. You know what I mean? That's where the Charlie used to, and the drink used to bring me as far as Glasgow. When I go out on a on a I'd be out for a week, two weeks, James, proper fucking off me barney. Anyway, I'd go anyway. That was one of my maddest nights that on the air ending up in Glasgow. And I went to the fucking boozer in Anfield. How was it for the 25 years when you retired and you were on the sniff in the booze? How terrible, hard? terrible, terrible. I mean, if you'd asked anyone, they'd say, oh, he's had a laugh. I, thought, I always have a laugh, but deep inside, when I'd be on my own, uh, it'd kill me. It, it's still today. It kills me. 
that what 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 happened to me, and what I thrown away, you know what I mean. But um, there was a part of me that like uh, just just at them times what I just spoke about when I am eighteen, nineteen, and being at heaven. I always thought if I went to another club, something my like, something different has happened. You know what I mean? Because that's when I really started. When my I started really drinking when I got in Everton's first team. So for the last twenty five years. I fucking have battles with proper um, mental health issues, bad depression, off the scale, suicidal attempts, the lot. It's been horrendous, absolutely horrendous. But in that time as well, I had um, I had three kids. I've got three kids. Me, Peggy's twenty one now. Connor's sixteen. And Freddie's eighteen. They're all doing all right. I've been, I've been, and what I, what I, what I said to myself was while all this was going on. The least you can do, Bill, is be a, is be a good dad to the kids, and that's what I have done. I've been a great dad, you know what I mean. I got father of the year every year, mm. honest to God. And uh, that makes me happy, lads. That sort of like so. I've been hands on with it. I've raised all my kids myself. Well, obviously with the Mars, I've done a great job as well. So that's off to them. But I'm I'm really close now. I've got I've got a few. I've got a handful. I can count my mates now in one hand. You know what I mean. I've got a good bunch of mates in the army. My girlfriend's lovely. Um, so things are like I've got a couple of uh, business interests in the pipeline nowadays. I'm waiting to go into a few schools to tell me story and that. So after all the, the ups and downs, I think my life's sort of going a bit better. Yeah. Going a bit better, James, but it's been absolutely horrendous. Uh, psychiatrists, rehabs. I went to another rehab and... Um, Ten years ago, my family paid for um, me to go to um, a rehab in Johannesburg. And um, that was about 12, 13 years ago, that was. And I've been clean now for about... Well, I used that programme. It was a very good programme up there. They'd all been addicts. He's all been where we've been with mountain health and that, so they knew the score, you know what I mean? It was very powerful, the, uh, the programme out, out there. And I use that programme now. And um, I've been clean now off the cocaine since my ma died, which was eight years ago. I've had a couple of bevies, I've had no Charlie. I've had a couple of Guinnesses and that, and that's about it, mate. So hopefully the corner is turning for me you know yeah, what was the moment for you to really go right I need to get my shit together obviously we get hundreds and hundreds of chances thousands of chances but there's always that moment you go right I'm going to give it everything now I need to make changes do you know what it was James it was like it was a mixture of stuff it was like when my mum died as I said to you before uh, my mum died it was in the uh, it was in the camp fields we had a uh, we had a, a drink, you know, the way you bury you bury them and like you go back and have, 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 a, have a bevy because of it and all that. It was in there. All my mates were there. There was hundreds there, all come to support me and the, my family and that. It was, it was great in there. I'd been out. My ma had been sick for a few years, so when she was really bad, I, I, was, I was out for two weeks solid. No kip, no fuck all, didn't give a fuck. My ma was dying. And when we buried her that night, I just, I just, for somehow, I put, I put my drink down on the bar and I walked out. I walked out and said to me, bed, like, right, that's it, I've had enough. And I never touched the drink for eight years. No rehab, no counselling, no fuck all, I don't know how I was on it. I, I blame my ma, you know what I mean? It must have been because I tried all my life to do. And it just come natural, just it just has enough for something. I couldn't put my finger on what 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 made me do it, or I was on it. I just couldn't tell you that. I just think it was my mum. Eh? I just that's that's all. The only excuse I can come up with is my mum was looking out for me. Cause if it didn't, I wouldn't be sitting here and out you put it that way. I was in a terrible state when my mum was dying eight years ago. I was dying myself. I wasn't asked whether I lived or died. To be honest with you, and um. And my kids, you grow up as well, don't you? My kids as um, adults now, and they've never seen me on drugs because they were only young, you know what I mean? So for the last eight years, I've been clean, lad. And, uh, but I'll tell you what, man, it's been, it's been, it's 
being somewhere I have, mate. It's ruined my life. The drugs has ruined my life, you know. The mm. alcohol, drugs, ruins your life. What's your plans moving forward for the future, Bill? My plans now for the future is, um, it's first and foremost, to stay clean and sober, James. And um, I've got, um, as I said, I've got a couple of bit business interests uh, coming up and that. Um, and uh, I'm just waiting to uh, me mate, some fellas being on me about the mental health side. He wants me to go into the, um, he's just waiting for the thumbs up on uh, 50 schools I can go in to speak to. And I'm just going to, I should have done it years ago, but I, obviously I was still using. And like, I've got a lot of experience in terms of mental health. And, and I need to, I need to uh, get, get to these school kids and then, um, get my story and my points across to these school kids because they need it because we're losing generations of, of kids. And talent as well. And talent, though. it's just going down the swanee, picking that first spliff up or having a bit of peer pressure off your mates and that. And and it can be as easy as that. It can just be as easy as that. Starts off with the old spliff, doesn't it? Or the ciggy. You know, you see your mates over there buying ciggies when you're in school and all that. You want to be one of the boys and all that. Well, well, well then they should be finished now, you know? Yeah. And so that's the roles I want to go down. I want to just give a big, a bit back. It's overdue, like, but I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm strong enough. I'm up for it. I'm, I can't wait to get cracking on it, you know? But that's a good thing. What about getting a book out, documentary? Well... I'm doing a book now. It's funny as you mentioned that, James. I don't know how long it's going to fucking be like because every time I do a couple of lines, I'm fucking snorting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, I've got a little author on board, Andy Nichols. He's um, he's a great lad. He's, he's done a few books now, and, and we're just trying to do something. And I've been writing a book for, uh, since Christmas last year. And um, it's taken its time, but there's so much to write, James. There's just so much bollocks that's gone on down the years and it's me last throw of the dice really and i want it right you know what i mean so when it's ready it's ready sort of thing there's no like uh thing you want to but i think it'll do well and that's the part of the story i want to get across to these kids like look what happened to look what happened to me you know what i mean yeah. it's all different it's, it's a little different things getting your life and that and you've got to be strong mate and Listen to your, the, the best advice I can give these kids is just to listen to your parents, your mom and dad, and that's just, that ends off. Your mum, your dad, your sisters, or your brothers, and that's it, mate. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's the best advice is listen to. And your ma, your ma's always right. Your ma's the one who's always right. For anybody that's maybe battling with addiction just now, Bo, um, what advice would you give for them? Addiction. Just find, just, there's always someone to there um, on the ends of a phone there. If you're struggling, going through bad times, you need to like, you need to first and foremost tell people about it. Don't keep it in. Don't don't fucking uh, bottle it up and all that because it will be too late. You need to you need to speak to someone and know it's hard. Because the worst thing is as well when you're using is to, is to talk about it. And to tell anyone, oh, I've just had a line, or I'm still drinking and I'm doing all this. You don't want to tell no one that. But you and then if you don't, you'll still suffer. You'll always you'll just sit there and suffer. So you need to get out, get into these meetings and that, speak to someone and take it from there, mate. Them meetings help as well. The AA meetings and the CA meetings and that. I've done a few of them down the years, they do help you. And um just don't pick that first bevy up, that first spliff, that first line, because you'll need a thousand. Yeah, it's scary though. You'll that. need a thousand, mate, and, it, and, it's a, and it'll bring you exactly to the same place as before, mm. to your knees, yeah. jail, fucking being to jail as well, I ended up in jail. What for? For driving, drink driving. That's what I was in for. Drink driving, yeah. mate, honest to God, fucking, and, that, and that's the life it brings you, mate. You don't have to go out and drink and to enjoy yourself. I've only just found that out now. 48 years of age, you know what I mean? But it's experience. That's someone I can, I can tell the kids, you know. Just, I don't know, you're supposed to enjoy yourself. I mean, some people like having a bevy and and doesn't it doesn't fucking doesn't ruin your life, you know. But addiction, if you say it'll grab fucking one out of ten people, and that happened to be me. Yeah, it's a scary place it, it, to be. It, it, it would grab, mate, you know what I mean? But 
Ja, as I said, if I can help a couple of kids, yeah, from going to my road, then I'll be happy. Yeah. I'll be You've happy. got a life experience, Bill. You've lived it. Yeah. Like I say, no matter, you, you still played for everything. Your dreams did come true. Yes, you fucking hurt the obstacles and the wobbles along the way, but you're not dead, man. Like You can learn from your life experiences to then help other people, which is an amazing thing. Going around schools, going and speak to the kids that play football, That like, to get an addiction at 19, you've got the world at your feet to then get an addiction at 19 shows you that there's no there's no age limits to when a oh, disease no. can kick in where you're fucking, you're bang on it. Absolutely not, mate. You said right. Uh, yeah, I've got a lot. I've got a lot to tell these kids and I just can't wait to get cracking, mate, because it's a terrible thing, addiction. And... And in this country, I don't think they do or not. I don't think they're on it, James. Yeah, don't give a you fuck. You go to doctors, mate. It's more, it's and more they only pals. Know, they only yeah, know yeah. what they've read up on. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? The fucking... I had to go to South Africa, me, for someone... I could, I could relate to someone. Someone talking to me who, who'd done everything, who'd been an addict. And that's where I had to go. And this NHS in this country, or these doctors, they, they, they haven't stayed out and snorted cocaine for two days. Not, not one of them. Well, you know what I mean? They've never fucking had a, a being on a bender. These doctors around here, these um, psychiatrists and all that, they just haven't done it. They just know what they've read up at, the feelings you get and the anxieties and all that and the fucking the addictions and the shit going through your head. They don't know. Yeah. They just say, right, what's up? We're okay. We'll prescribe you then. We'll need them. But you're and in a good it. place now, feeling better. I'm in a better place now. It's the best I've felt for a few years now, James. After losing my mind, it took me ages getting over that. I still think about it every day. But yeah, I'm positive. I'm waking up positive. I've got stuff on. I've got a meaning. I've got I've got something to do now. I've got something to give back in this life now. And I'm I'm I'm, not, I'm excited about it. I'm, it's like making me debut again, lad. Uh, good on I you. can't wait to help people out, mm. you know. And I swear to God, man, I'm gonna give the give it to them. Like proper raw, mate. And that's it. Here's what you're not supposed to do. You need to listen, mate. And drum it into these kids, man. Even the ones that don't listen because they're the ones that ends up fucking on it. Yeah, but... The ones who are not listening to you. Like I say, you've got the life experience. This is just a new chapter to your life. And for anybody that's maybe watching, like you get involved with Bill as well maybe take them round schools man and speak to the kids but for coming on and day and telling your story brother I thoroughly enjoyed that it's um oh, thanks, it's, uh, how are you feeling about it I'm feeling absolutely absolutely relieved it's all <laughs> is it over now yeah. it's all over brother, James, thanks a lot enough, thank look, you. can I give a big shout out to of course the, you can Jockey, me mate there with the uh, San Zalapino mm -hmm. stuff yeah. Ball Street and Liverpool Perfect, brother. quality gear yeah. Just go in and say, Jockey, Billy sent me and you got them for the tenner. <laughs> How's that, Jockey? Cheers.